Welcome to the video podcast series at the College of Education and Integrative Studies. My name is Jeff Pass. I'm the Dean of the College. And today we have three students and one professor from our Liberal Studies Department. And uh, the professor here is Dr. Jeff Roy. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. And we have three students who we're going to get to a little bit later, and that's Joanna. Say hello. Hi. And Jordan. Hi. And Francisco. And let's start off with you, Dr. Roy. Uh, you're new to the faculty this year. Uh, what is your research interest? So I look at how people use art, music, dance to sustain or resist structures of power in cross-cultural encounters. And my specific area is India, um, well, which is also quite a big area. But I look particularly at the music and dance of uh, India's Hijra community, or what is known as the third gender community there, to see how they mediate different powers, different global movements, um, such as the LGBTQ movement, as well as different forces of nationalism and capitalism in India. Okay, so yeah. that's pretty complicated. Let's break it down a little bit. <laughs> okay. uh, we have the Hijra. Yes. And how do you spell that? H-I-J-R-A. Okay, and you call them third gender. Tell us what, they, <laughs> or they call themselves third gender. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, they are known widely as the third gender. Um, many of them are identifying as transgender now, or gender nonconforming, um, also third gender. So I look at the ways, very complicated ways, in which different parts of the community are either adapting to sort of global forces, of um, gender equality, gender, or so I should say global movements uh, like gender equality and sexual equality. And is this across the nation of India or in a particular region? I particularly, I look at the Mumbai uh, Hijra community, but I'm also referring to communities that are scattered throughout India. Okay, and you do a lot of interviews and observation. Absolutely. Uh, to find out uh, how they deal with the various forces of nationalism, which is very strong in India with its yeah. Hindu uh, orientation, uh, but also with philosophical currents and political currents. Absolutely, yeah. It's all sort of intertwined in a very complex way, and each part of India, each community, uh, has a different way of negotiating these forces. So what are some of those different ways? So some communities are very resistant and turn inward and reject uh, some of the more global, um, inf globally inflected identifications like LGBTQ um, identities and the, and the sort of movements and practices that are so associated with them. they just want them. no part of it, they're in denial about it. Uh, not in denial, but just very protective, I should say, okay. yeah, of their um, more locally inflected vernacular practices and identities. Um, the groups that I work with in Mumbai are a little bit more assimilative in their approach. So We're Living in a more cosmopolitan area. Exactly, yeah. Mumbai being India's uh, basically business hub um, is a, it's a very international city. It's very cosmopolitan. So you have a lot of communities that are looking outward um, to try to reach larger masses and actually are using their music and dance as a way of drawing attention to their community's plight. So that's kind of what I'm looking at, yeah. Okay, so the, the music and dance is key to it. Yes. Uh, the arts yes. as a way of self-expression or collective expression. Absolutely, yep. And how did you discover that as a research interest? Very good question. I entered this field having uh, played violin for almost 20 years. Uh, I was actually learning Indian music on the violin for a number of years with an Indian guru. Um, I did my first trip to India a few years before entering graduate school back in 2007 and just sort of got to know people in the field. And, uh, you know, being queer myself, it wasn't really, uh, it, it felt like a natural sort of space for me. And in your academic pursuits, did you 
find uh, support, resistance, combination? A lot of support um, throughout. So my, you know, both my institution, UCLA, where I did my graduate work, was very supportive. Um, I received support from the U.S. government in some cases through Fulbright. And then also in India, um, I was affiliated with a number of organizations in India to conduct my, you know, my research. And then the local Hydra communities were very warm and embracing of me as a person and also the work that I was doing, which was a bit unusual for them. They were like, why am I, why are we, you know, why are you studying our music and dance? Why is this so important to you? What are you getting out of it? But yeah. Mm -hmm. And you forgot to mention the support that you're getting from your current dean. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, do you use any of this in your teaching? Absolutely. Uh, some of your research? Yeah, I'd like to, in my teaching, one of my main focuses is drawing connections between arts fields, no matter what uh, field it is, in the visual or performing arts, and society and culture. So a lot of what we do in this class is, um, you know, use arts methods, arts theory, as a way of interrogating different, um, you know, practices that are happening in culture around us. And then one of the main focuses of arts integration in particular, this class arts integration, is how do we employ our critiques and our analyses and the methods that we learn in you know, these various fields, arts fields, how do we employ them in the classroom? Uh -huh. And being in our liberal studies program, which is for many students a, uh, a lead into the teacher credential program to become uh, multiple subjects or elementary school teachers, Yes, uh, this is something that they need in order to be effective professionals. Absolutely, yeah. Arts uh, inquiry, or what we're calling creative inquiry, or high-level thinking, is, an, is a very important uh, method to use, not just in the study of arts or culture, but also math science. Uh, social sciences, all of that. How would it, would it relate to math and science? Can you give me an example? Yeah. Um, arts uh, inquiry, creative inquiry, is about teaching your students to ponder outside of the usual um, sort of yes, no, um, black, white, um, this is right or wrong uh, sort of ways of thinking. So it's about asking, you know, why questions, how questions, what if questions. If you're learning about the solar system, how can you get students to um, think about it in a dynamic way that's, that's you know, beyond the uh, sort of practice of naming and uh, memorization. So we want our elementary school students to think at a higher level, yes. to think creatively, yes. to come up with new questions, possibly leading to new solutions, mm -hmm. rather than just at, take it all in at the uh, knowledge level. Yeah, exactly. It's not just about the test, right? It's about how you can apply these practices in, in life, too. And you have a, a particular course that you uh, are using with these students? Yeah, absolutely. This is arts integration. So it's an arts integration course. Mm -hmm. So let's open this up to uh, the students and any of <laughs> you can start. Uh, when you signed up for the arts integration course, was this what you were expecting? I can honestly say I took a previous art integration class and it was just the fundamentals of like different art projects I do with students, like how to teach like acting to students. So when I signed up for this class, one, it was a requirement, so of course I need to take it. But I wasn't coming in thinking what I was about to learn. And it was really eye-opening. The first class, I went, oh my gosh, this is totally something different. And it was really exciting because I already work with students already um, at an after-school program. And I got to see, like, they really don't think outside the box as much as they should. And it was really eye-opening and it made, it challenged me to like, when I would do my lesson plans, they were so generic. They were so black and white, like you said. And the what if questions were really what got my kids engaged when I started doing that, like 
the solar system. Well, what if we didn't have the sun? What would happen then? And they would just start venturing off into these new elaborate ideas. And it was really amazing to see like, they were more interested in the learning process and I was having more fun as a teacher, not just filling our green off paper. So that encouraged you as a teacher or stimulated you as mm -hmm. the kind of teacher that you want to be. Oh, yeah. So definitely. this is transforming your orientation toward the profession. Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it, it made me not change my approach as the teacher, but as like an individual and how I approached many of my other classes now. Like when I'm doing my papers and he did an assignment like where you break your syntax and you have to change up how you you write and like just break the rules of writing because we're so used to writing in a particular format and very structured and very like, it was not fun. And I remember writing the first draft and it was so boring where he came up to me and I like X'd everything out and like crumpled it up and like threw it. I was like, no, this is not right. And I finally like realized what I was hiding was like deep within. And like once I finally got it going, I was able to break that syntax. I, I saw my writing take a whole different level. And like in my, it affected my other classes too. I saw my writing scores get higher than they were before because I wasn't afraid to dig deeper than I was before and not stay to that structured writing style. This is the kind of thing that every professor wants to hear. I'm sure you're very, very excited. Prof <laughs> professor Roy is like my favorite professor. <laughs> um, you should say that after the course is over because you don't want to be buttering them up. <laughs> they already, but, they're, they're from last semester. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> In terms of syntax, what do you mean when you say breaking or uh, letting go of syntax? Well, syntax is like, how I interpret it was like a voice. Your voice and like, and a voice is how you write. And when you get into college, you have to sound very professional and very just to the T, go through all the details and like cite, use other resources. But when he said break your syntax, you had to go back to when you're like five and go to this memory and write it as if you were five years old. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like, <laughs> I don't want to do that because like, I have a speech impediment. So I'm like, this is terrible. And then I was like, wait, can I start writing the words how I spoke them? So you didn't have to worry about sentence structure no, or punctuation yeah. or noun verb agreement? No, yeah, no, it was, it was. It was liberating. It, it really was because like, there's some students in our class that did just like, short broken sentences like daddy why like and it was just really wow like it, it communicated was, the, yeah. the sentiment even though it didn't conform now a, a skeptic or a critic would say well we don't want you going out to schools teaching children the wrong way to construct their writing oh, how yeah. do you respond to that well of course they have to have a basic structure of like creating sentences that could be used in an academic setting. But I think these would be really good tools to use for them to be able to not get scared of when they're writing. Because I know a lot of my students get really like self-conscious of like, Ms. Jordan, this isn't smart enough. No, it is smart enough. Right. Those skills will come along the way. Like I still don't know how to do proper punctuation. That's my worst thing right now is proper punctuation. But letting them do these activities makes them just want to express themselves and go for those big ideas and go for those. you can always go back and, and put fix in the it, periods yeah, and commas and so forth. That's, the, that's easy is teaching kids how to add those things in, but getting the real feeling and for them to develop their own voice is something so much harder that a lot of students have a struggle with. Wow, that sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, how about the rest of you? Do you want to share your uh, initial reaction to the class? <laughs> the syllabus, how you mentioned it's, uh, sometimes it's like standard education where we walk into a class and we believe we're going to read a couple chapters, get tested at the end, and then we're going to get our grade. But um, with this course, he allowed us to um, tap into our creativity and that sparked our, our like, curiosity because we have so many options. Because in school, we usually have a writing assignment or, or, uh, or a certain, like a, we're confined, but here we weren't confined. He wanted us to venture out and make connections along with the music and the arts, but with ourselves and then how they mention our culture. So that was very refreshing and a couple of, um, you learn things about yourself as well. Can you share something without getting too personal? Well, um, 
a couple of the assignments, like the final stood out to me a lot because the final assignment was, um, he gave you free range. Mm -hmm. So you could draw a dot on the paper and explain that <laughs> dot the best you can. Well, <laughs> <laughs> if he loves your story. Maybe not a dot on the paper, but okay. <laughs> but um, it really, what the final assignment that I ended up doing was um, kind of sketch art. And um, it was a portrait of my son. And um, as I drew that portrait, they say like you, when you have a, a, a child, it's like a love you cannot explain. When I was drawing that picture, I was really thinking because I see myself through his eyes and I want nothing but the best for him. So when I was drawing that picture, I thought about my past and my upbringings and whatever, everything from as far as I can remember back up until it got me to this point. It just really had me thinking a lot about what I want for myself, what I want for him. And um, it was very refreshing because um, when you get a when you get an assignment, it I didn't feel nervousness. I felt, and the the product almost became. By the way, uh, it was the process that you were engaging in, and I would imagine your uh, challenge is to convey that to students when you were a teacher. Yeah, right. And you're all going to become teachers. Is that your goal? Yeah, my goal is a little different. Oh, I uh, I tutor special needs kids right now, so I um, have that I guess teaching. Um, but um, my goal is to become a correction officer and um, lateral to uh, out of state to to the private prisons in Nevada. You probably wouldn't be surprised to know that uh, among the prison population, uh, difficulty with reading and writing is uh, is uh, pervasive. Very, very. And uh, any kind of uh, support you can provide in self-expression. And there's all kinds of uh, traditions of uh, prison writing and journaling and art uh, self-expression that you might be able to tap into. So you're well suited for that. And our liberal studies program, we should remind everyone, prepares for other professions besides yep. uh, Yeah, that's, that's teaching. one thing that I, I think that um, when people think of liberal studies, they think of teaching. But um, in reality, like you get a you get a range of humanity, social sciences, natural sciences, and arts, and that sparks your curiosity where you might go in there. I, I came in here thinking I was gonna be a teacher, but then when I started taking my other courses and, and my curiosity got sparked by the, by, um, by the prison reform and corrections, um, because there's a lot of um, uproar regarding that. So that, that led me that path, but then also I had all the, the learnings from everything else where I could integrate it into that. So it was integrating studies, it's, it's what it is. You're able to put it all together and use it. To... And it's by design. Uh, and we have to give a lot of uh, thanks to uh, my forebearers who came to Cal Poly Pomona to create this program and continue to let it evolve and, uh, and restructure it. So it sounds like it's working. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna, what's your story? Um, so I came into this class excited. Um, it was a class that I had to take just like every other, you know, liberal um, studies major. And I was excited. I was like, um, I actually saved it since we converted to semesters. I saved it to be a semester class so I can have it longer. Um, and why did you want it to be over 15 weeks rather than 10 weeks? I just thought it was going to be a really fun class, you know, taking the previous, the, the art in, arts integrated integration part one. Um, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, a little bit of dancing, a little bit of acting, drawing, you know, we took it together, together right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so I was just thinking, okay, you know, it's going to be that, but in form of a lesson plan. And so I'm over here coming the first day. And then within the first, I don't know if it was the first or second day, we're like, okay, so write. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, you got to write. You got to write in this like five, four year old, whatever. And I was like, okay, you know what? I tend to think a lot of outside the box. So this is going to be easy oh no it was so hard I was like like oh yeah this happened and then this and I'm over here trying to make it super super kiddo and I'm like I don't like this this is too perfect and so I went up to him and I was like I don't like it like I, I find it boring like it's supposed to be cute but it's boring and then he's like well you know if you need a he told me different ways and I'm like well it's because when I was a kid I didn't speak any English. So he was like, then why are you writing it in English? So I was like, oh, I can do it in Spanish. And he said I could. So 
there's this thing about the fly <laughs> that I'm sure you guys remember, uh, and it's just a way of writing. So the fly represents just kind of like your ideas and F-L-Y how they end up. Fly, fly, yeah. Like a metaphor. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. a metaphor yeah. for um, how your ideas just develop, change, and you know we say follow the fly. So if you have an initial idea, you change it. That's perfectly fine. Like it kind of um, goes, it develops. And so I ended up telling him, I was like, from my original one, I didn't just follow the fly, like I married the fly. Mm -hmm. So everything that I had changed completely. And so what I ended up doing, instead of doing it in this like little five, six year old, um, little girl voice, I ended up doing it now as reflecting to me being a kid. And I actually did a combination of um, Spanglish, so Spanish and English. I actually did a mixture and it's funny that you know, I get to go after both of them because I was going to talk about the writing assignment and then I was going to talk about the, the finding yourself. Um, I didn't think I was going to come into this class realize or getting to know to know more about myself. Um, I came in and I was like, oh, it's going to be fun and I'm going to draw and I'm going to do this. And then it was nothing like that whatsoever. And yeah, it was fun. I'm not going to say it wasn't like it was definitely, definitely has been like one of my favorite classes if not the favorite um but it was challenging and I didn't think it was going to be challenging I'm like it's an art course technically like how is this supposed to be challenging art's supposed to be easy yeah Mm -hmm. and so (laughs) it's something that I'm like yeah like I can do with my students and stuff but how can I do it with them if I don't know my own style if I can't find you know myself and so same thing like it came to the end the last the final project and I was like He's stressing me out. I don't know what to do. And I told him, I went to his office and I was like, your project kept me up all night. Like, I didn't know what to do because I wanted to be, I was so, I was stressing out the most about being out of the box and unique. That was my main stress the whole class. And I'm like, I thought I was, and I'm, I feel like I'm not. So, you know, like, how do I do this? Like, he's like, it's not supposed to do that. Just something that you like, plain and simple. You know, you like to draw, draw. You like to write, write. You like to whatever. But I, you've had 16 <laughs> years of trying to please adult authority figures. Exactly. It's t- tough to let go of that. Yeah. I mean, I remember a long time ago, one of my previous classes, it's like, okay, this is what you're going to do. How you figure it out. And, it's, and, and it takes you back to being a kid. And that's what happened a lot in his class. It's like, it, t- it takes you back to not just your kids that you will be teaching in the future but you being a child it's like how was i thinking like really how was i thinking we really can't forget what that's like if we're going to be working with children exactly. or young adults <laughs> professor uh dr roy um what's your reaction to all of this oh <laughs> <laughs> well um i it makes me feel proud and and if I can inspire one student out of my class then I feel that I've done a good job. How will you be a different teacher as a result of this experience uh, taking this course? I think one thing one major aspect of this course too was um, how the textbook but then also the assignments integrated the classroom setting like it was you had to create lesson plans you had a you had a um, it kind of made you feel like you were in a classroom or it kind of had you kind of seen how you would run a classroom. And that was, it put you in the setting, it put you in that position of, you know, like, because the future generations, they need proper proper foundation and the building blocks. And and that was one thing that I enjoyed as well. I'm going to start my career off with working with children, but I actually want to be a professor of child development and adolescent studies. That, that, that's my big goal, because the same thing, if I can inspire one of my students to be a better teacher, they'll each have their own like 30 kids for the next like 20 years. So I can affect more children that way than just me, myself, teaching a classroom. And I think this class really helped me challenge my own thinking. And it's going to make me challenge my students thinking once I, once I get to them. Because like you said, he did the what if, how questions instead of when you're planning that lesson plan, doing those simple questions like, how do you know which state is which state? I did a lesson plan on like United States history because I know a lot of my students were going through that and they had to label which state was what. 
And I remember them getting really annoyed with it. And I was like, how, how can I change this? And just that alone of doing the deeper thinking questions can help so many teachers be better because they're not gonna just stick to like, like you said, black and white. They're gonna wanna dig deeper themselves and they're gonna make their students wanna dig deeper themselves as well and wanna get to know the bigger questions and think outside the box and be critical thinkers and problem solvers instead of just doing what you have to to please the teacher. They're gonna wanna do like, well, this is the question that's sticking out to me, so I'm gonna keep going with that question and then as a teacher, I'm going to be more open to be like, OK, that's not quite the assignment. But you know what? Like, let's go with it. Let's follow the fly. Like, let's see where we go with this <laughs> thing. And I think that this class is going to benefit it so much for me in the future. I think it also kind of in my in my scenario, you know, it's it's like going back to that first one. It's like, how are you as a kid? So why, why are you expecting these like? kids to be like little soldiers realistically speaking i mean should they have rules i mean yeah they should should they have a certain way they they need to be in the classroom you know they should but that doesn't mean you get in there and they just sip it you know it means oh you have an idea okay what is it have a dialogue with them get into try and actually get into their minds and um not completely get down to their label because then are, how much are they going to respect you um, but yeah like have them understand that there's someone who's going to understand them or at least try someone who's going to be there and it's like instead of having to just be that teacher that oh yeah I have the perfect classroom no one talks and I think that's one of the things I loved in his classroom it's being able to go there and I know I have freedom in there yeah, I have assignments to do. Yeah, I have deadlines to meet, but that doesn't mean I go in there and just do my work quietly. We had, I think every classroom, we had a dialogue about everything and anything, you know? And so I think, I think in my case, like that's one of the things that I really grabbed from the class that I can incorporate into my own classroom, just being able to give children the freedom to have that open mind. Right. to ask questions instead and to of... give yourself that freedom as individuals in all of your relationships and all of your uh, interactions so this is part of what's designed to be a Cal Poly Pomona it's a polytechnic institution and uh, we try and do things a little bit differently we try and think emphasize thinking uh, rather than just simple products and, and basic knowledge because that basic knowledge is only going to carry you so far. It's how you approach and solve problems. And the kind of person that you are as the holistic development, that's what we're trying to do. So it sounds like this liberal studies course fits very well into the overall polytechnic uh, goal of this institution. So uh, it makes me very proud to hear you speak about your learning this way. It makes me very proud to hear that uh, a new professor can be so effective uh, in just one semester. Uh, and there's, the best is yet to come for all of you. So thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody for the next installment of our video podcast.